So I, I actually met Eric about six months ago. He works with someone that I know pretty well at EF Tours. Uh, we, we actually have three things in common. Uh, one is I send all my kids to EF Tours uh, to go abroad, and so I believe very deeply in the company he's working for. The second thing is uh, the biggest chunk of the Berlin Wall is outside of uh, EF Tour. Uh, in the, the biggest chunk of the, of the Berlin Wall that's in the United States is actually in front of his building, and it's really cool. You ought to go over there. It's a big, big piece of the wall. I, I, it was rain, so I didn't check the, the graffiti. The third thing is he and I play in the basketball team together uh, at Notre Dame. I was the starting center, and uh, he was the, the short forward. So uh, we, we just we have a lot of history together. So um, when I heard about he, uh, Eric came over a couple months ago, and we talked about kind of social media in general, and it was just really interesting that someone in his position at EF Tours is is doing this, and I just thought, hey, I want to come over and hear about what the book's about. And so I invited him to come, and he took us up on it. And so uh, my pleasure to introduce him here. So thanks for coming. No, thanks for having me. <laughs> Doc, really appreciate it. Yeah, I get to hear all these fun facts. The duck boat tour goes right by our office. And so there's always some new tidbit that I pick up, either about the Berlin Wall or that 70% of the people that work at our company are, are female or something that's true or not true from the duck boat tour, however they're feeling for the day. Um, but anyways, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the book which you guys have and, and why I think that social media is one of the greatest shifts since the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's a real honor for me to be at Google. This is probably the savviest tech audience I've been in front of, so it'll be real nice to get into Q&A uh, to hear what you guys are doing and, and kind of have a two-way learning here. I'm going to open up a couple slides here and we'll walk through the presentation. The three things I want to cover today is that social media is changing behavior. Obviously, it changes your online behavior, but what a big thing has changed is your offline behavior. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, businesses must adapt and recognize this behavior. And also, what are successful people and also companies doing in this space? Um, as you saw in the video, it takes liberty with James Carville's quote. It's really about a people-driven economy, stupid, that it is it's really dissected down to where anyone can get on and, and transfer information quickly. The cost of entry is so low. Some of you guys chuckled at this. This is from Hitwise, that it's really overtaken pornography as the top activity on the web. This is intriguing. This is 07 versus 09, the most visited websites out there. 07, it's showing Yahoo. I think I'd argue that it was, this is from Comscore, that this would have been Google any, even in 07. But here you can see, obviously, it goes from five that are in the top 20 to nine social media sites that are in the top 20. And three of the top five are now social media sites. And you could even argue that like Google with Search Wiki that's come out, and also stuff like on Google Maps where you can actually go in and change some of the directional stuff, that there's huge social components of Google as well. Also on CNN, half their content is now provided by Twitter, it seems, if you ever watch CNN these days. And it's, I don't know, did any of you guys see the John Daly? Spoof, not spoof, but they one of the I think it was Rick Sanchez that was reading Twitter and he thought I was going to say something that supported Palin and it was something opposite of what he thought it was and so John Stewart was making fun of him going Rick Sanchez you need to pull your head out of your ass you know while you're reading Twitter you got to read this before you see it um, Craigslist you could argue is also social so it's there's a fine line between what's social and what's the general web. I could sit here with stats all day, but I think a picture tells a thousand words. This is just showing the popes on all of these activities. And as it showed, I mean, wiki, you guys know, means a Hawaiian term for quick. And a lot of companies are using wikis in different ways. Facebook, to translate their site into Spanish, they've just put a wiki up for their users, and they're able to do it within four weeks. Their user base just translated it. So there's companies that are being smart about it out there, and how do they crowdsource stuff effectively? Social, does anyone know who this is? Nice. Ben Roethlisberger is the uh, quarterback of the champion Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, so there's two major forms of behavior in social media. There's preventative and also braggadocio. Pre preventative is no, no, that is not me. So try not to get fired and also trying to get hired. Um, and so that's really affecting your offline behavior. You almost have to live as if your mother's watching you just because of the transparency. The second form of behavior is more fun, is the braggadocian. It's me, me, me. That was me. That is what I'm doing. Um, what this is having is that 
if you're updating your status and your tweets all the time, you have a real-time feedback on your life. So you're not going to look back 10 years from now and realize, what did I do with my life? Uh, you're going to see real-time that, okay, I'm putting that I'm watching reruns of Saved by the Bell. That's not quite as cool as my friend that just posted that I'm whitewater rafting. Um, and so that's really showing the offline effect that's being driven by social media. So there's a lot of companies that are trying to wrestle with what are they supposed to do in the social media space? How do they leverage it? They know there's a lot of power out there, but how do they properly leverage it? Preventative behavior from businesses is that some of them can't get a handle on it, so they decide that they're really not going to do anything. Um, and that's really analogous to an ostrich sticking their head in the sand and, and really not being part of the conversation. The difference is you, big companies, for them, they've always been in the position of being able to say, okay, we're going to do this or we're not going to do this. But with social media, it's going to happen without them, whether they like it or not. So it's more important for them to actually be part of the conversation. Um, it's similar to maybe some of your friends haven't gotten a Facebook account because they don't want to be tagged in the photos or they don't want to have this stuff that's out there about them. Um, the thing is, those photos are still going to be out there. It's whether you want to be aware of it or not. Um, so it's better to be part of that conversation so that if there is a photo or something egregiously said about your company, that you can actually proactively do something about it. Uh, this is a John Deere example. Eight months ago, they didn't have a Facebook fan page. And these are all f groups and fan pages that were being formed around their product. And so it ranges from country girls who ain't afraid to dip a drive a John Deere. I love John Deere because nothing runs like a John Deere. And then obviously this one's doing something to the logo that most companies don't prefer to have done to their logo. Um, so what they've done is they're now back in the space. Um, they've got 88,000 fans, so they've entered into the space. And it's not the sexiest product. They sell lawnmowers, and also they sell heavy machinery, more of a B2B company. Um, and that's one of the top questions I get, too, is, is it just a B2C play? And really, on the B2B side, it's actually more important because in B2B plays, there's usually smaller there's a smaller set of relationships that you need to maintain. So it's important for you to have a, a stronger relationship. And what it does is it augments that interpersonal communication that you have with your company. Um, the other piece that's easier for B2B is that for B2C, they almost have to have some of the engagements in a digital format. They almost have to take their customer service in a Twitter-like format because it's just the mass scale. They can't have that personal relationship, whereas B2B, to have that strong relationship, it's even easier for them to maintain it and leverage social media because they have less of a scale. This other thing is second, a lot of companies are afraid because they might have negative feedback, but great companies actually accept and love negative feedback because they can actually fix their product and fix their service. They can do something about it. So the great companies are saying negative feedback is good. The worst kind of feedback is no feedback, is that your customer just starts to leave and you don't know why they've left you. This third one is that if you aggregate all of your customers, especially, let's say, if you aggregate all your customers into one area, that people are afraid that they'll come in and poach them, that they'll be easy to come in and say, oh, these are customers of said product. Let's go in and grab those guys. That's not a problem with your social media strategy. That's a problem with your product. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your clients are that easy to pick off, then there's something inherently wrong with what you're supplying to your customers. So this is what's going to be really, really interesting for me to talk with you guys today and see. I'm sure you guys have stuff that you guys are producing that I don't even know about. But where this thing is going, at least the way I see it, what a lot of the book's about, is that in the future, really, your search could still happen on Google. So you do your search on Google, but it's going to pull in different items, whether those are coming in from Google's repository or really it's going to be coming in from all the other places on the web. So if you're searching for a hotel, it'll pull in information from a TripAdvisor it pulls it in and also it says, instead of it being opaque like it is today on TripAdvisor, it'll actually say, this person's from your social graph. Here's what they think about said hotel. Um, and so that's where it eliminates some of the multiple individual redundancies that we have today, whether it's involved with, how do I find the correct product for my specific need? And a good example is finding, finding a baby seat. So if you just had a, a, a baby, it's a pretty important task if your wife says, okay, you're in charge you go buy the, the child seat for the car. That's a pretty important purchase. You want to make sure you don't screw that one up. Um, and so what do, we have some great tools today. Obviously, with Google, that's where they're going to start and go in and search and try to find out what is the best product. They'll try to find some review sites around child seats to figure out and vet through 
um, what that is. They'll also probably hopefully run into some folks that they know that also have a kid and see what kind of seeds that they have. Um, that becomes much simpler in the future from a standpoint of the search still happens on Google, but now what comes in is that of your 150 friends that you have on your social network, 30 of them have purchased this seat in the last year, last year or two years. Of those 30, 20 have purchased this exact seat. And then here is what the reviews are on that seat. Um, so that helps to eliminate a lot of what I call multiple individual redundancies. If an individual, if, if there's 20 people that wanted to buy a child seat out of your group of friends, and five have already vetted through that and done all the homework and the due diligence to actually use the product, then the, the rest of the 15 can kind of have a good comfort level knowing that, okay, this person, these five people have done all this stuff. I don't have to redo all this work. So I can go out and get this seat and feel pretty comfortable about purchasing it. So this is on Twitter. How many of you guys are using Twitter? All right. How many of you guys use it for personal reasons? All right, how many use it for business? How many use it for both? So this is just getting back to, this is a great customer service tool. A lot of companies like a JetBlue, Comcast, Zappos, anybody, when I sell this, when I'm, for me, when I get on the train tonight, I'm gonna go on and go to search.twitter.com and they can look and see everything that's being said about their brand. And it varies all across the board from this first one, free movies on New York to see JetBlue flight because the blank was broken and the delayed an hour to fix it. So the second thing is JetBlue smoking signs on, two JetBlue flights made emergency landings at Kennedy Airport. Those both aren't fairly good. This one though, on JetBlue right now, Red Eye Impacts the Big Apple had a blast in Orlando. So it varies from positive to negative, but it's important for them to stay on top of it. So a lot of companies are just using this as a customer service tool. Um, a little misnomer in the news is that they think Twitter's this amazing, great thing for customer service. Definitely it helps, but one of the reasons the customer service is so good is because they've taken their best and brightest customer service reps and put them on Twitter. So obviously if you called in and they only funneled you to their best reps, it's gonna be a little better experience. But it's one of the huge powers of Twitter is the search functionality to be able to get in and see what those conversations are. For B2B companies, it's huge because they have their clients, but obviously their clients have their clients. And historically, it was tough for them to see what the pain points were of that downstream client. But today, they can go on. If you're in Intel and you're supplying chips to Apple and the Dells of the world, you can go on and see what those pain points are of your customers by going into tools like Twitter so that you know ahead of time so you can work with Intel I mean, work with Apple and Dell if you're Intel and say, hey, look, we know that they're having problems when they're in X, Y, and Z. Here's what our solution is. So they can see ahead of the time what the, what the, what the issues are. Now, for marketers, how do their jobs change? When they go into these tools, major mistakes that companies do when they get into Twitter and Facebook, they immediately get in there and do the old school messaging, which is more blasting, more the 30-second type commercial um, that kind of strategy. And what they do is they come in and they're basically shouting once they get in there. So they'll go into Twitter and they'll say, hey, we've got this new product that just came out. We've got it 30% off. And you'll see all their streams right away is just all about, about them. And that's the worst thing you can do. Um, the best thing you can do is that there's Dale Carnegie and David Ogilvy, two of the best marketeers of the last century. Both took a little different tactic. Dale Carnegie's the one that wrote how to, how to win friends and influence people. And David Ogilvy was more the messenger, great 30 second commercials, great marketeer, um, both super successful. But in the here and now, the more successful folks are gonna act more like Dale Carnegie. They're gonna listen first. They gotta know what the conversation, how is it, how is it, how is it transpiring, what's going on, what are the needs um, before they sell. So it's listen first, sell second. And the beauty of all this is that products that deliver the best value will win. Well, historically, you'd think that that's always the case, but it's not because um, historically, the bigger companies control the distribution systems and the, the marketing mechanisms. So they can make up for bad product by having control over this piece. But all of a sudden, this piece goes away because the information is everywhere and it's tr the transparency is real time and it's fast. And they can figure out in the video, you see all the word of mouth now becomes world of mouth because it just happens so quick. And in the end, that means the customer wins and in the end, the, the great companies win. 
So this is an interesting example of just different tactics on how companies go about using social media. Um, so this is about, I guess, a year and a half ago now is that applications came out on Facebook. And so there's a company that thought, wow, it'd be a great idea. All those people just put pins on their wall, their map, showing how cool they are of where they've traveled to. Why don't we make that more of a digital version? And so the first company set off and started off. They had a head start because they knew someone at Facebook. And they launched it. And they got 50,000 users a day. So they're thinking things are going great. They get an email from Craig Ulliet, who says, he's a 23-year-old kid that says, hey, have you thought about not making it mandatory for us to give, you, give our email address? I think we should just get this tool for free. And also, could you make it a little flashier and, and better? And the company goes, well, we're getting 50,000 downloads a day. You know, it's working. Why fix something that's broken? So Craig sets off, and he decides to write his own thing. So he sets off, and not only writes his own thing, he starts his, a whole company called Where I've Been. So then he launches Where I've Been. That thing all of a sudden shoots through the roof, gets 600 to 700,000 monthly subscribers, and it's one of the better successes of the application. At the same time, there's companies like TravelZoo and TripAdvisor that are trying to figure out, okay, this thing's huge. Do we write it ourselves, or do we reach out to Craig and try to purchase it from Craig? So they try to reach out to Craig, and they think he's like this kid that's in his garage, but it turns out he's got a partner that worked at Priceline for several years. So anyways, TripAdvisor comes close to purchasing this for $3 million. Actually, press release goes out, not from them, but a report goes out that they did purchase it for $3 million, but they didn't. What they decided to do is um, the CEO at TripAdvisor is very sharp. He goes down to his team and goes, how long is it going to take us to build something similar to this? And his team says, it'll probably take about 40 days. Um, and Steve Coffer, the CEO of TripAdvisor, has got a sign outside his door that says, speed wins. And he goes, can we do it in four days? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, they say, sure. So, <laughs> But I'm sure it was like, sure, we can do that. We'll be working all night for the next four days. But they spent a weekend and obviously two more days just working around the clock to get this thing out there. They utilize uh, Google Maps because they go, why wouldn't we use this? This is what people are used to using. It's the best tool out there. So then they decide to go and do their own thing and launch this. And now they have close to, it varies, but it's usually around 3 million monthly users that use this tool. And where I've been still has a fair amount. They still have about 400 to 600,000 monthly users. The original company doesn't really have any active users. Because um, the original company was using old constructs. They thought they had to get that person into their database. That's how they've always marketed it. They need to be in my database. My boss is only going to reward me if I add people to my database. But it's a whole new world. It doesn't matter. As long as you message to them, it doesn't matter if it's coming from your database or whether you're utilizing a platform like Facebook. You can still message these folks. The other thing <laughs> is the second piece is really beg, borrow, and make better. You don't have to have the original thought and the, the first to market to have this stuff work. It's really just looking out there to see what's out there, see if it's meeting everyone's need. And if it's not, then adjust it accordingly and make it better. Um, and then three, as I said, speed wins. The difference in speed here is it doesn't have to be first to market. It's just when you decide to do something, you need to get it out there and put it in beta. And, and I'm kind of going to take this back because you guys understand all this stuff. A lot of the audiences I speak to do not. But it's just getting this stuff out there because you're going to get out, fail, then fail better, and then win. Because in social media, the first time you're going to launch this stuff, usually it's not going to be that successful. So you're going to have to adjust it after you get it out there. Then the fourth piece is just you can have multiple winners in this. Where I've been still has 400,000 to 600,000 users, so it doesn't have to be the original only idea that's out there. This is another interesting example of what companies are doing. Um, ESPN, how many people are big ESPN fans? All right. So they've historically, to cover the NFL, they have a couple reporters like John Clayton and and Edward Werner to go out and a couple more that they travel around the country and they try to become experts on the team. But what they found out through a lot of their podcasts and also online is that there's actually a better model out there. And so they've started to solicit bloggers that are local to each team and also just super fans. And what, what happens is that these folks have grown up with this team. They know everything about this team. Um, it also saves ESPN a ton of money because they're not flying people all ar around the country. 
the listener enjoys it more because these are real experts. It's not someone that's trying to learn up on this stuff um, and know what all 15 teams are doing. And so I call it the Tom Sawyer approach. They're really convincing these folks to work for them for free. They're painting the fence for free and they're loving it. They're an ESPN blogger, they're an ESPN super fan. The huge difference is that with technology enabling it, that your c customer today can be your competition tomorrow. If I'm listening to a fantasy podcast and these guys cover both baseball and football and they're not really up to speed on all the players are asking each other, oh, what's that guy's name? And the listeners sitting there going, this is crazy. I know more about this. I live, eat, and breathe fantasy football. Then the next day they might start their own podcast. Um, and so it's another proactive way of ESPN. Um, the old cliche is, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, they're joining them before they can beat, beat them. So they're realizing these people could be their competitors. Let's reach out to these bloggers and make them part of our team before they become our competitors. So this is from TechCrunch. It's, this is from a big music executive. They didn't list his name, his, him, or her, him or her name out, but it's all part of a master plan. The spreadsheets and financial models dictate that suing customers and partners just makes too much sense. So the reason I put this in there is a lot of companies, they have fear of this technology, false evidence appearing real. Because if you're a music industry person, you should have just embraced that change. You no longer have those distribution costs that you once did. You no longer have these production costs. It's actually a, a lot higher margin. Instead of suing your customer base, you should have embraced this technology change from the get-go. And if they thought about it, it's similar to when they used to hand out records to DJs in the 50s to get the word out. They gave that stuff away for free. Um, and obviously there's a lot of case studies like Radiohead that gave out their stuff for free and they actually had record sales. Uh, Monty Python launched their stuff on YouTube. They were having issues where um, everyone was posting their stuff on YouTube and they fought it for several years and they said, screw this, let's reverse it. We'll just go in and do our own channel. And so that they had record sales of everyone selling DVD once they, once they made that change on the YouTube. But this still continues to occur today um, from the standpoint of you're seeing it play out a lot and you'll see it play out more on the cable, cable industry. Because obviously the Comcast of the world, they control your internet pipe and also your TV pipe. But a lot, of, a lot of folks are going out there just like I don't have, I don't pay $150 for cable. I watch everything online, stream it through the Mac, through my TV. Um, just like when people gave up their landline telephones and just went to wireless, you're seeing that more and more. And Comcast is struggling with it because they don't, they're losing money. So they're trying to figure out ways, do they charge by bandwidth usage? Um, and the difference here, the way that's going to play out is going to be intriguing because they control a lot of the pipe, right? So hopefully WiMAX comes into play, but you're going to see that kind of wrestle with itself in the next couple of years. The other industry that's really wrestling with it as well is the, the publishing industry. Now that you have these e-readers, you saw that stat up there that 35% of sales go to the Kindle. Um, the, where that stat breaks down is that if you're selling on Amazon a hardcover book and a Kindle version, that the Kindle will get 35% of the sales. Um, and actually Dan Brown's new book, I can't remember the name of it, but there's actually more sales to the Kindle right now for that book um, on Amazon, not in total, but just when you compare it on Amazon. But again, for them, they have an opportunity, the publishing industry has a huge opportunity if they embrace the change because books are inherently social. You pass on a lot of your paperbacks when you're done reading them. You go, this is a good book, here, pass it on. Um, they've never gotten any revenue off that. But with the Kindle, they can got to figure out what that revenue stream is for that pass along. Is it 99 cents? You know, what is that pass along stream? Also, there's a ton more data at their disposal. Think about libraries. They don't know how many times the book's read in the library. But now they'll be able to tell if there's a license agreement for these e-readers. So each library, do they have five licenses that go out? Or, or is it infinite? This is another just juxtaposition on two different treatments on getting into the cable thing I just discussed is NBC versus ABC. NBC during the Olympics, they streamed a lot of stuff from Beijing, from, yeah, from Beijing live. Uh, but they didn't s stream the stuff that we wanted to see. They didn't stream Michael Phelps live. They were streaming ping pong live. Uh, <laughs> are you the reigning champion here? Yeah. <laughs> but so they were 
but at the end of the day, it's eyeballs or eyeballs. If you're, if there's an advertiser that's paying to sponsor your Olympics, isn't it inherently better to show that as many people as possible? There's people at work that don't have their TV at work, but they can watch it online. Um, but the problem is they wrestle with is that some of the metrics haven't caught up. So they can't show to that advertiser that, hey, you know, this is, we've got these Nielsen ratings that are the offline ratings. We haven't really been able to figure out the Nielsen online ratings to compile them together to give it to you and show you that you paid X, Y, Z, but we gave you this many more eyeballs. Um, and so they, what they do is they let the metrics kind of lead them instead of best business practices, which would be, of course, we'll show the Olympics to as many people as possible and then it'll show the ad to as many people as possible so that in the end, more people buy our sponsor's product. Um, so the PGA realized that, hey, that's probably a good idea. So what they did this year and also last year, so Tiger was in the final hunt both this year and last year. Last year he won in a playoff match um, against Rocco Mediate on a Monday. So it was a Monday and they decided to, to let it go online. And it shut down many company servers as people were watching uh, this tournament play out. Then this year they took it one step further and they go, let's really embrace this stuff. Um, and so again, it came down to Tiger against Yang from South Korea. And what they did was enabled on their site, on the PGA.com, they enabled it so that MySpace, Facebook, and Twitter, you could see these feeds come in real, real time. So you have Facebook, there's MySpace, and there's Twitter all in one area. And obviously this stuff's blasting out on those properties as well. So a lot of people that were on Facebook or on Twitter could see, oh my gosh, I totally forgot that this is going on. It looks like Yang and Tiger on the 14th hole, I'm gonna watch the last four days I mean, four holes of the tournament and get on there and check it out. The other thing they did is they had an iPhone app so you could watch this live also on your iPhone. So they really fully embraced it. So it's just a different, you can see the different tax that people are taking. And I'll leave it to you guys to decide who you think's taking the better approach. I mean, I would argue strongly that it's ABC with what they're doing. Because it's all about the user. What is, and you guys embrace that every day. It's all about what does the user need. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's a good point too, is that in the future, everything's gonna be served through an IP just because of the tracking capability. So it's funny, I think we're gonna look back at this couple of years and laugh and say, I can't believe they're so resistant to serving this stuff over the IP. This is just a quick example of all companies make mistakes. And so Apple, who some people think never make mistakes, they, and this actually ties in with you guys, because what they did was there's an app that was written, and a lot of you guys are probably familiar with this, but they wrote an application that was pulling into the Gutenberg project, which you guys have been very helpful in, in putting books uh, for free online. And so this application did that, but one of the books was the Kama Sutra, and so Apple decided, well, we need to shut the whole application down. And after about three hours of just getting pummeled with every comment you can imagine, they reversed uh, their decision. Um, so it just shows that if you're a company, if you make a mistake, just own up to it and adjust it accordingly. And for the guy that wrote that app, I forgot his name, but they say that it's the best thing that happened to your app is to get banned by Apple. <laughs> <laughs> so then this is just some of the, sums up a lot of what the book's about. It's act more like Dale Carnegie and less like David Ogilvy. Listen first, sell second. What I didn't talk a lot about is this one essence, be true to that essence. It eliminates this social, what I call social schizophrenia, is that historically you've been able to kind of have your two personas if you wanted to. If you were an accountant during the week, if you're Al the accountant and you've got everything down to the T during the week, well on the weekend you can be avalanche Al. You can go out and party your brains out. But the problem is with the transparency and the tiny phones and all the, everything being distributed with the Ben Roethlisberger photo that I showed, uh, that. Unfortunately, good or bad or indifferent, that, that's really not the case anymore. The world has changed, and you have to adjust your behavior accordingly. A lot of CEOs ask, should I get on a Facebook account, or can I have two accounts? Um, I always recommend 95% of the time, it's a terrible idea to have more than one account. You're gonna have to be who you are, and that's it. I mean, and if you don't wanna get on, if that's not what you enjoy doing, if you don't enjoy going to a cocktail party and and networking with everybody, then I'm not gonna send you that cocktail party and do that. So make sure that you really are comfortable with doing this stuff before you get into it, and then just be yourself once you're on it. Products and services will find us 78% trust peer recommendations. Uh, social media will help eliminate the multiple individual redundancies. That should be good for society, less waste. 
of people that will find exactly what they need real time quickly. And then for marketeers, what does this mean? You're going to be less of an advertiser. You're less writing these great award-winning commercials and more about providing content that folks need and desire. Um, if you go back to the opening video, is that what I did, this a tool, it's ironic. I have to use social media tools to sell the book. Um, and so before launching that video, it's really hard to get things viral, as you guys know. But it was listening to the space of what the main need was. And the main need was, I can't convince my boss that social media is a big thing. Can anyone help? And so that's why we tried to put all those stats together and put it, put it together and get it out there and launch it. So that's what being a content provider is all about. Party planners more, if you think about Mashable, they have these tweet ups. And so they'll, they'll host these tweet ups where they're taking all these folks um, that have met on Twitter and just having a face-to-face a -face conversation at certain hotels around the country. Um, so that's another thing is just being able to aggregate people. A lot of people put on conferences now. So that's the way that, that the world changes. Um, one thing that I'd argue that I think might happen is that it's going to be so important for people to review your product or service is that the money then flows from over here, which is mainly brand awareness, to, okay, this person bought my product. And this is a new concept. You've already, already gotten those surveys when you go to a hotel. It's like, hey, you might be able to win 25 bucks or a trip around the world if you fill out this survey. It's taking that money that's over here on branding and really saying, good, bad, or indifferent, if you fill out a review on our product, you know, you'll get X, Y, and Z. And so the real debate on that, that's going to happen. The real debate on that, does it influence what that review is? Hopefully not. Hopefully it's just a pure review. Talked a little bit about B2B. It's just as important, if not more important, than for B2C. And then marketing mistakes. Making a mistake in social media is better than not doing anything at all, because at least you're learning something. And then this last one. It's more outside in than inward out thinking. Historically, companies have always gotten in their meeting rooms, figured out what do we think is best for the marketplace, and take several months, um, and then they go out with it. But now it's really, what is that user doing out there? A lot of these companies, when they jump into the social media space, there's already groups developed, like John Deere, so they can see what's the main consensus of their need. So when they go in the space, they can meet that need a lot better. That said, I'd like to thank you guys. I'll open it up for, for Q&A and dialogue.